Once upon a time, there was a farmer and he was walking in one of his fields and he, he finds an eagle egg in the ground. So for fun, he decides that he's going to place it in one of the nests of his chickens. Well, the eagle hatched out and uh, became one of the family of the chickens. And uh, of course, as he grew older, he began to look around at his brothers and sisters and he realized that he didn't look like them, he didn't walk like them, he didn't talk like them, he didn't fly like them. But being young, he accepted the differences just as young people are inclined to do. Well, one day, he's out walking with his family and he sees an eagle flying overhead. And so he says to his mother, he says, Mommy, he says, what's that? And the mother hen replies and says, oh, it's an eagle. She says, that's the most majestic bird in the sky. See how he soars over the trees. Well, the eagle then said, ah, oh, mommy, I really wish I could be an eagle when I grow up. And his mother replied and said to him, don't you think like that. You're a chicken and you'll always be a chicken. Now, the lesson of that parable for us is that it matters who we are but it also matters who we think we are, right? Now, as Christians, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, are we chickens or are we eagles? The Bible tells us that if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're actually greater than eagles. It tells us that we are none other than the children of God. And again, this is not me telling you this. This is what the Bible says. If you trusted in Christ, you are adopted into the family of God. The problem is that often, even though we might realize it, we don't live like we are children of God. So today, that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about how true Christians can soar up like eagles. Now, <clears throat> I just want to give you a bit of background here, uh, what Isaiah is uh, talking about. Um, the prophet Isaiah had a very tough ministry. Uh, he was uh, called to preach to Judah uh, to be faithful to the Lord. And uh, unfortunately, the, the Jews, the uh, Judah, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't repent. And so as a result of that, they were taken into captivity in Babylon. So when he's talking like this, uh, they're actually, the Jews are actually far from home and they're very discouraged and they begin to cluck like chickens. So the Lord speaks through Isaiah to his people, and that's what we read in chapter 40, verse 27 and 28. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is dis disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So what he's telling his people, even as they're in captivity, he's saying, look, I know that you're in captivity and I know that you're unhappy, but I am the eternal God and I have not stopped existing or caring for you. I'm outside of time and I'm not subject to it. So your temporary captivity is not a problem for me and I'll bring you home again, just as I promised that I would, so lift up your heads. That's the message he's trying to get across to them. And uh, of course, we as Christians, uh, we must know the same thing about the Lord. It's easy for us to complain because uh, things seem to get worse and worse in our lives. And we forget that God knows every circumstance of our lives. He's interested in our lives and he has promised to care for us and bring us through all, that, all those troubles. So no matter how bad our circumstances might be, we can be sure that he's going to bring us through time and bring us safely into eternity. So we must believe that our temporary troubles can't knock God out of heaven. And since he's with us, even in our difficulties, even in our trials, even in our sicknesses, we have nothing to fear. We are safe. Our souls are safe in his hand. It's very important that we realize that and we live like it. So with this in mind, uh, let's read verses 30 and 31. <clears throat> Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So this is a wonderful promise. And, uh, you know, again, we, we memorize scripture, right? If you want to memorize a the scripture, then this is one of the scriptures that uh, I'd recommend that you rec recognize, uh, that you, uh, that you uh, memorize. <clears throat> and uh, I'm thinking that you may be wondering and saying, well, Mike, uh, is it really applying to us? Is he really talking to us? He said, I've been a Christian for years and years, and I get tired all the time. He said, I've never soared like any, an eagle. I, I've run and I get weary all the time. Uh, whenever I walk, I don't faint, but I'm glad to sit down and put my feet up. Well, of course, when we read passages like this, we realize that he's speaking metaphorically. He's not talking about our physical strength at all but rather he's talking about our spiritual strength. You see, the Jews despaired when they were in captivity. They were afraid that God had forgotten them, and the situation seemed grim, far grimmer than the situations that we find ourselves in, right? So God gives them this promise to cling to while they are in captivity. Now today, we can apply that promise to our particular situations. Hope in the Lord is the answer to our troubles, to our weariness, and to our weakness. But we must learn, and this is the key, we must learn to hope in the Lord, just as the Jews had to learn, in, learn how to hope in the Lord while they were in this awful captivity that they hated very much. You see, their hope wasn't disappointed because we know what happened, don't we? We know that 70 years later, the Jews were brought back home from captivity back into the land of Israel, something that had never happened. When, when uh, nations were exiled into other countries, they didn't come back. But somehow God managed to do that uh, by his mighty power. And of uh, course, we still see that the Jews are in the land even to this day. Now, just before we begin, I want to remind you of what hope is in the Bible. Hope in the Bible is not wishing that something will happen. Uh, for example, uh, I'm sure we all hope that the Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup this, this year, right? We all hope like that. Uh, but that's not biblical hope. It might be a, a desire. It might be a wish. It might be a prayer. It might even be a delusion, right? But it's not hope, okay? It's not hope. Biblical hope is waiting expectantly for something that cannot fail to happen. It's not being doubtful. However, it does require patience. And that's another virtue that we have to learn to develop. The point that I'm making is that we must learn to hope before we can fly like eagles, and that takes great patience. So let's pray as we begin our message today. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, uh, we often feel that our lives, with all their troubles, are hidden from you. And uh, you don't understand what we're actually going through, how painful and disappointed our hearts can become. But in the gospel, we've heard and we have known that you, the everlasting God, the creator of all things, have entered our world in Jesus Christ, and you've used your almighty power and unending love to deal with our sinful state. In so doing, you've given us a new life to live. And every day you provide spiritual strength for us to patiently face the daily battles of life. Lord, may we not despair, but rather seek that renewing strength from you each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, waiting expectantly on the Lord will enable you to renew your strength. Again, this is verse 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, by waiting expectantly, this is a definition of hope, right? That's what hope is. It's, wait, it's waiting expectantly. And it's that hope that will feed our souls. And the soul, amazingly, also feeds the body. Uh, we see this with sick people. Uh, if, a, if a sick person is going to recover, hopefully they will, but if they're going to have a chance to recover, they mustn't give up. They must expect to recover. The body responds to a positive attitude, and that will give the body strength and help it to heal itself. If you're negative, 
it's going to have the opposite effect. So that's why we always encourage people that are sick. You've got to be positive. You've got to see the bright side uh, of life in this situation. It's the same with, uh, with prisoners. Uh, I was reading about World War II and the Jews in the death camps that kept on believing that the Nazis would be defeated. Uh, they had more chance of actually surviving the death camps. The, the, the ones who thought it was hopeless and there was no chance that the Nazis would ever be defeated, they perished quite quickly. Uh, the survivors were those who had hope, right? So, so it is with the Jews here in Isaiah's day. Those who trusted in the Lord thrived in Babylon. And indeed, we, we know from the example of Daniel that they actually became very high-ranking officials, and he became an advisor to the king, no less. <clears throat> now, you may say, but Mike, we're not in captivity like the Jews. Why do we need to hope in the Lord? Well, in fact, we are captives. This world in which we're living is not our home. It's actually more like a prison camp. And our present bodies that we're living in now, these are not permanent. Uh, what is more, they're actually fallen bodies. And so that's why we grow weary, and that's why we faint physically. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, that's what we're doing in our Sunday school. But in Romans chapter 8, it tells us that, that we groan as we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies and the liberation of our world. So we are trusting in the promise of God, not to return us from Israel, but we are trusting in, in the Lord our God for a new heaven and a new earth in new bodies. This is our hope, right? The redemption of our bodies. It's a wonderful hope. And this hope is grounded in the promises of God about eternity. So hoping in these promises, and that's why we preach them every week, hoping in these promises will, fe will feed our souls and stop us fainting in the way. You know, after I, I got uh, gallstones, I had to have my gallbladder removed. And uh, after the operation, uh, uh, my wife and I, we went to Cuba to recover uh, for a week, spent a week in one of those resorts. And uh, it was great, right? You can eat and drink anything that you like. It's all free. But suppose that we went there and we didn't understand that everything was free. And so we went there and we looked at these fancy restaurants and we thought, there's no way we can, we can afford to, to eat in, in these places. We may have stayed in our room with our rice cooker and just ate rice all week, right? So how relieved we would have been, right, if we found out that it's all free. You know, we'd have a great time, wouldn't we? Well, we can be like that with the Word of God. The Word of God is our banquet to enjoy. This is why we come regularly to church, so that we can feast on the truths of God found in his word. This is what preaching is. Preaching is the declaration of the great truths from God that will feed our faith. That's why you're here. You're here today to feed your faith. It's meant to strengthen you. That's what preaching is all about. You see, just as the body thrives on physical nutrients, so the soul thrives on spiritual truths. And this is why God is reminding the Jews here of who he is. What's the truth about God? Well, God is the eternal God. Now, knowing this, hopefully will stop them being weary because it will give them hope. The eternal God is with us and he's on our side. Now, secondly, waiting patiently on the Lord or hoping will also cause us to soar like eagles. Again, this is verse 31. They, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now, this is a metaphor, I think, for great strength. If you've ever seen an eagle uh, fly, uh, it hardly flaps its wings at all. Uh, he kind of stretches his wings out and up he goes and he can go almost out of sight. And he appears to be holding himself up in the air with no effort whatsoever. Now, of course, we, we are not like that, right? As we go through our lives, we are falling and we're flapping and we're trying desperately to keep airborne for the Lord. So we need to learn how to fly like eagles. To do that, what the eagle does, he uses the invisible air to keep him afloat, as it were. But eagles have to learn how to do that. 
Even eagles have to learn how to do that. And if you go on YouTube, it's fascinating. Uh, they've got these uh, uh, videos and it, it shows uh, uh, mother eagles or father eagles or whatever, teaching their young ones to fly. So the young ones are out there flapping like crazy. And so the, the mother eagle will be flying around just with its wings out, just uh, flying around the, the little one as it's flapping and flapping. And what the mother eagle is doing, it, he, it's teaching the chick how to do it. This is how you do it. You just keep your wings out and you'll be okay. It's fascinating. Check it on YouTube. It's really good. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's how eagles learn to fly. Now, we've got to do the same. We've got to learn how to fly for the Lord. And what I mean by that, we've got to learn how to have a strong hope in the Lord. It's very important that we do that. I was reading about eagles, and apparently if an eagle stays in the nest, and of course he wants to stay in the nest because he's comfortable, but if he stays in the nest, he'll die there, right? So what the parents actually do, they're so determined that their chick won't die, they push him out of the nest. They won't let him stay in the nest. Because the eagle is afraid because he doesn't understand that his parents are actually setting him free, right? Uh, the parents are helping him live the life of an eagle by making him fly, right? Now, as human beings, we're in the same situation. We're kind of trapped here, chained to this life of sin and death. We don't want to leave it, right? But God says, look, you can't stay here. For if you stay here, you are going to die. I must set you free so that you can live forever. Now, this is why Christ came. This is why Christ was crucified. This is why he rose again, to set us free. But we struggle with God, and we say things like, but Lord, I want to stay here. I like it here. I don't want to fly. So until we truly trust in Jesus Christ, we are not free. Then after we've trusted in Christ, then he will begin to push us out of the nest. He will begin to release us from sin and death and the worry that, that it always brings into our lives. The moment we trust in Christ, he gives us the wings of hope, right? So falling out the nest is actually the best thing that can happen to us. Then we can put out our wings and we can begin to practice how to soar up into the earth. Hope is what carries us above the troubles and the uh, trials and the difficulties of this life. With this hope, of course, then we can begin to enjoy our life for the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we sit back and expect God to do everything for us. Not at all. No, we run and we walk, right? These are action words. We are not idle while we wait for the Lord to bring us out of this captivity and deliver us safely into that heavenly world. So let's think about that. Let's look at the uh, rest of the verse. What is it? If waiting expectantly on the Lord, we will run and not grow weary, it says in verse 31. And again, this suggests to me the idea of strength. Uh, we won't grow weary as we hope in the Lord because he never grows weary. I'm thinking this time of a, of a child in the father's arms. The child doesn't get weary because it's depending upon the strength of his father who's carrying him, right? Our heavenly father is the one who holds this whole universe in place. His power is constant and it never wavers. So we look to the Lord when we are weary and tired and we find grace, his grace is sufficient in the time of our great need. And this keeps us going on through our troubles as the good shepherd carries the lambs and doesn't drop them, just so the eternal God will carry us and not, not drop us as we trust in him. I was thinking of Job as an example. I was thinking of David as an example. I was thinking of Paul as an example. You can go through a whole list of, of uh, Bible characters, right? We see that the Lord was faithful to them. He brought them all through. And I think based on that alone, we can assume that the Lord is also going to bring us through, just as he did with them. <clears throat> Again, hoping in the Lord is similar to taking a long journey. So suppose you have to go to Vancouver. Now, you could walk. You could walk, I suppose. It'd be very tiring, but you could do that. But usually what we do when we go into Vancouver, we book a flight, and uh, we simply trust in the pilot, 
and wait patiently for him to get us there. And when we trust in the Lord, this is what we're doing. We're depending upon him, not on our own power, to get us safely to that eternal destination. As, the play, as, as you're in the plane, you don't carry your luggage with you, right? You either put it in the hold or you put it in those uh, uh, overhead bins. And then you don't worry about them. You kind of forget about them. They're not important to you because you're on a journey, right? You're on a journey. Who cares about our belongings when we're on a journey? We hold on to them lightly. We're not too troubled about them. We also, when we're on a plane, we behave ourselves. We sit quietly. We don't pick fights with the other passengers. And we keep the peace. And why do we do that? Well, because we expect, there's the word again, right? The expect. We expect that we're soon going to reach our destination. Do you see how hope motivates us to live a godly life, a peaceful life with all men? This is what it is. We, 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 we know it's not going to be long. We're going to be through this mess, and then we'll all be safe. But that's our hope. We're hoping and we're expecting eagerly that the Lord will deliver us. That's the way that we should live, like that. So this hope provides a better life for us now, a more peaceful life. Uh, think again of the eaglet in the nest. Uh, what does he see? He sees a nest full of twigs. He sees thorns. He sees mud. He might see, see a sheer rock wall. It's all pretty boring sitting there. And the only excitement he gets is when his mother or his father brings him a juicy rabbit to eat. But then it's back to waiting again. And it's very tiring. But he waits patiently. And then one day, the time arrives for him to leave the nest. And what does he do? He stands on the edge of the nest and he stretches out his wings and he takes the plunge. He begins to fly. And once he begins to fly, then no longer is he bored, no longer is he tired. He sees the world differently than he did from the nest. Now he sees that the world is full of beauty and it's full of excitement. Now he has a mission. He has the mission of an eagle. And it's the same for us Christians. Once we trust in the Lord, we begin to learn how to wait expectantly or eagerly. And this enables us to take our eyes off the mud and the twigs and the rocks of this life and to see the eternal beauties that lie ahead of us. And this is what Colossians talks about, isn't it? Uh, we set our affections on the things above, not on the things below, knowing that our lives are in the eternal world. That's where our life is hidden, in Christ, right? And that chases away the weariness that we often feel with the disappointments of this life. So finally, uh, we wait expectantly on the Lord. Uh, when we do that, we will walk and not faint. Again, that's verse 31. Uh, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, this suggests to me uh, patience or endurance or perseverance. Uh, we don't hope for a day as Christians. We don't hope for a, uh, we don't hope for a, a year we don't hope hope for a decade no as christians we hope for our whole lives uh, physically uh, the longer we live of course we get a weaker and i guess it's easy to give up because of frailty but with hope our spirits wait eagerly and they don't give up so the body gives up but our spirits don't give up this is why it's so important that we know what hoping is that's illustrated by uh, three friends. Uh, they come to a mountain and they have to get across the mountain. So the first friend, he decides he's going to tunnel through the mountain. Uh, he gets there, but it's very hard work. The second friend, he goes all the way around the, the mountain and he gets there too, but it's a long way. But the third friend, she spreads her wings and flies over the mountain. And that's much easier. And that's what a strong hope does. It gives you wings. You see, our problem, our problems may be big, but they're not as big as the eternal God. So let's keep perspective and remember that the difficulties of these lives that we all have to face, they're going to soon be over. All our troubles are small in comparison to the power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, the hope of eternity makes the pressures of time small in comparison so we can soar right over them if we have the right attitude if we have the right expectation and uh, and we can do this of course joyfully our troubles uh, can become like stepping stones into eternity 
Again, if you're on a plane and you're flying on a plane, you cross the highest of mountains and you don't even notice them, right? You don't even notice them. So with the hope uh, that we have in the eternal God, uh, when we realize just how great God is and how merciful he is and how loving he is, uh, the troubles that we face in this life, we realize are tiny in comparison and we can fly right over them. This is what Paul talks about in Corinthians. Think of an eagle. He's sitting on a mountain crag and he's and he watches the sky in the distance on the horizon filled with black clouds. You may even see streaks of lightning. He sits perfectly still and he waits and he waits and he waits until he begins to feel a slight breeze that ruffles his feathers. Now he pays attention. He faces the storm. He stretches out his wings and he uses the storm that beats against him to rise high up into the sky. Now this is what God wants for his children. In Romans, we, again, we were just doing this. In Romans, he tells us that we are more than conquerors. He doesn't tell us we are conquerors. He says we are more than conquerors through God who loved us. God wants us to face our troubles with faith, with hope, and with determination. He doesn't want us to be clucking like chickens, but soaring like eagles. And this is how we can be a testimony to the people around us, the people who have no hope. Most people don't believe this. They don't believe what we believe. They have no hope whatsoever. So what we've got to do, we want to be a testimony to them. We've got to face the storms of life with hope in our hearts. No matter how bad it gets, we always give glory to God. We always try to reach other people for him and pass that hope onto them so that they too can experience uh, the hope that the, only the Lord can give. So in conclusion, uh, hope in the Lord, or waiting expectantly, right, are the wings that God has given to us. Therefore, our job is to strengthen our hope every day. We can't fly like eagles with the wings of a sparrow, right? And we can only grow strong in the Lord by feeding our hope with the truth. And this happens as we increase in our knowledge of who the Lord is. As we've seen here, he's the eternal creator of all things. Better still, he's also the savior of all. Now for myself, <clears throat> of course, you know, I'm getting old now, but uh, I get tired and weary all the time. Uh, but uh, when I say that, I'm talking uh, physically. On the other hand, when I think of what God has done for me, in Jesus Christ, sinner though I am, that he loved me and gave himself for me. My spirit is lifted higher than an eagle can fly. And so it's knowing that we are saved in this way that will lift our souls up into heaven and fill us with this expectant hope. But without Christ, we have no hope at all. Not at all. And far from flying up to heaven, we can't get any higher than the tomb. Only with faith in Christ and we see that the tomb is open, and only with hope in Christ can we see our way out of the tomb. So it's important that we trust in the eternal God. He will lift our soul up into heaven, and he will never drop us. So let this truth renew your strength and stop you fainting in the way. Let's just pray together. <clears throat> Our gracious God, our eternal God, we thank you for you, our, our mighty Savior as well. And Lord, we know that through Jesus Christ, as you lifted him up on the cross, you've given us a hope that cannot fail. We know also that he will never drop us. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. So may this truth renew our strength and stop us fainting in the way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.